it's 10 45 so i'm going to go ahead and get us started um thank you everyone for being here with us today um yes so we're so excited that you could join us for today's session um this is going to be covering telehealth usage and strategies um for today's first session we're going to be starting with telehealth dynamic competencies and innovative technology bridging providers to rural residents in need I'm Aislinn Taylor, and I'm the CTRC Program Specialist, and I'll be the moderator for this session today. Next slide, please. So to start, I just want a reminder that this session is purely for informational purposes. The CTRC has no relevant financial interest, arrangement, or affiliation with any organizations related to products or services discussed in this session. Um, and before we begin, a few tips for the event platform we're using today. Whova makes it easy to access event features using a web portal and their cool mobile app. You can explore the agenda, view upcoming sessions, use the community tab to start new topics or engage in conversation with other attendees. And also be sure to check out our sponsors who supported this event and view their offerings. Be sure to make your Whova profile up to date so other attendees can use this to connect with you. Also a note, today's session is being recorded and will be available to view through the event platform by next week. And lastly, please feel free to post your questions and comments in the Whova chat window. We'll use the last few minutes of this session for Q&A. And with that, I'd like to introduce our guest speaker, Next slide, please. Dr. Jillian um, Williamson Yarbrough from West Texas A&M University. Uh, Dr. Yarbrough is a clinical assistant and the Virginia Angler Professor of Management at West Texas A&M University. She earned her BS in education from Texas Christian University, her MS, NBA, and PhD from Texas A&M University in Management, Education, Human Resource Development, and her MS in Forensic Psychology from the University of North Dakota. Dr. Yarbrough has over 20 years of experience in higher education, teaching online, face-to-face, -face, and hybrid courses for both undergraduates and graduate students. Her teaching areas include organizational behavior, cultural intelligence, healthcare management, and human resource management. Her research focuses a focus examines key competencies, competencies that are important to effective communication via care technology, including ongoing examination of telehealth competency necessary to support rural residents. Dr. Yarbrough, Yarbrough the floor is yours. Thank you. And I think I'll, I'll need to go to the next slide. So this is, you know, the, the introduction slide, my telehealth dynamic competencies and in innovative technology bridging providers to rural residents in need. And this is some of my absolute favorite research that I have conducted. And I'm, I'm really thrilled to be with this group today to talk about this research. And we can go to the next slide. And this shares a little bit about my degrees and my background, but I want to share how I found myself um, working in a distanced environment. And it started in maybe 1997 at Texas A&M University, where I had a graduate assistantship at the Center for Distance Learning Research. And at this time in 1997, I, got, I dove in head first, looking at distance learning. And in 1997, you know, this was the emphasis of my research, the ability to bridge high caliber researchers and prof uh, professors with um, students throughout the world. But I also began to focus on rural students and taking this technology to bridge our number one high caliber professors at Texas A&M to our rural high school students and, our, and helping them take the leap from high school to college and be successful. And I had a lot of questions like, is distance learning really even education? Can people learn through technology? And I know the answer now, you know, 20 years later, and I've stayed in distance learning all this time, the answer is yes. And not only can people really learn via technology, 
in many cases, online learning is richer, uh, more engaging, and allows people with diverse backgrounds to come together and learn. So that's how I kind of began looking at technology as this bridge between experts and those in need. And so uh, next slide. Well, I've spent a great deal of time in Texas. You can see my degrees are from a lot of Texas universities. I have had opportunities to uh, work and contribute from Palo Alto, California to Spartanburg, South Carolina. So I've gone from coast to coast and I have driven all through California. And when we drive through California, this is a picture of um, in California, we can see there's many areas that are very rural. And while this is, this is a reality in many areas of California, next slide, we often picture this area of California. And I have a great deal of family in Pasadena and Los Angeles. So I see this when I go. And this is, they have wonderful medical facilities, right, in Los Angeles and Pasadena and wonderful medical professionals. And sometimes we forget that there are areas of California that are more sparse and rural that are in need of the kind of care that's available in a Los Angeles or a Pasadena. And so I began looking at the statistics. And while I teach in the panhandle of Texas, we can also see that many other states like California, like Montana, these other areas, they have a great Wyoming, a great rural population with, um, with urban sparse through. And it's more rural than we realize. And I think it's fascinating to look at the, um, the demographics of the states and to really get a feel of how many people are living in rural environments. So the, what I specialize in at, at West Texas A&M, I teach the MBA, our MBA students who are specializing in healthcare management. And this has been one of my most rewarding fields. And I take a lot of responsibility and a lot of pride in the content that I put together. I am preparing medical professionals to lead medical uh, organizations and institutions. And I think it's very important. And when we look at the statistics, the demographic statistics, we realize that our medical professionals must be prepared and knowledgeable about supporting rural residents. And so every MBA student that I bring through my healthcare management course, I wanna be sure they're prepared to use technology to support patient and provider needs. I've also had the opportunity to be a visiting scholar at Berkeley and this experience over the last few years has given me a foundation of information and the way that Berkeley thinks about research and the Center for Science, Technology, Medicine, and Society. How do we look at research? And a lot of the research involves listening. It involves reviewing what other research is already available and understanding people and using this information to problem solve. And that would be the foundation of the research I've conducted. So my study, I began to look at over 60 million Americans live in rural areas in the United States. And the, one of the concerns about this is there's a lower life expectancy for individuals living in rural areas than in urban areas. And there are many factors that contribute to these lower health outcomes, but one significant factor is limited access to healthcare. And telehealth, it presents one solution, and it's a solution we should examine further. So over the last 18 months, I conducted 12 in-depth interviews with telehealth experts throughout California. Primarily, my interviews are focused on how to use telehealth to bring about quality of life for rural individuals. I also conducted surveys throughout the country with healthcare professionals, and I combined the, the information I obtained in the interviews and the information I obtained in the surveys to create a competency model. So from these interviews and from these surveys, it was identified that healthcare managers, specifically healthcare managers that are going to be involved in understanding how telehealth can bring strategic value and benefit to both patients and providers, some key competencies they must have 
they must have technology and communication skills. And this would mean that they have video and audio communication skills such that they could use the technology we have that, so that is allowing patients and providers to have video and audio communication. And we'll talk about, it is important that the provider and the patient have both video and audio to fully communicate with each other. And we'll talk about why. A second competency the healthcare manager, healthcare provider must have is an understanding of the remote patient need. What is the experience for a patient that is working with or being supported by a provider that is at a great distance? And one way we can examine this remote patient experience is of course through surveys. Another way would be through observation. The and third competency is understanding rural patient needs. So we have to understand the, the remote patient need. Those are one set of needs. Then we also have to understand what is the unique need and experience of being a rural patient. And telehealth should be not complicating things for the rural patient. It should serve as a bridge, giving the patient access to care that they need. A fourth competency, telehealth technology competencies, they must be, the provider must be trained and prepared to use telehealth and the technologies that we have available. And that would include infrastructure and technology access for the provider, right? And then a fifth competency, telehealth applications, understanding how telehealth can support health for rural residents. And my title of my presentation is Dynamic Competencies. And as we move through the next slides, we're going to add a little bit more to this competency model because it is dynamic based on growing information, growing literature, growing feedback. So concluding ideas from my study that was about 18 months long is that telehealth can improve access to healthcare for rural residents. And I think this is an important just foundation idea. Can telehealth bring benefit? My research, my literature review, my interviews, my surveys say, yes, it can. But there are some important steps that must be taken. There must be technology access. And this continues to be a significant challenge for rural residents. And we're talking about access just to the technology, then to broadband, to internet, and even if individuals are given the technology, if they're given iPads and there is broadband, there is internet, then they still need technology literacy. So there's a lot of hurdles that have to be filled in, but they can be filled in and this can improve quality of life. Providers, one of the things that I enjoyed so much in talking with the people that I interviewed, their energy and their enthusiasm and their belief in using technology to bring about improved quality of life is there. The providers had energy, they had enthusiasm, they had belief that they could contribute more. Offering quality healthcare is an ongoing issue. There isn't going to be a succinct one size fits all solution. It's a global issue that's going to have a dynamic solution. Providers and patients, they need training in telehealth. Providers and patients need training in technology. And providers and patients are going to need access to up-to-date technology. So I wanted to look at some key literature, as I mentioned. So I did my study. That is my competency model. Those are my conclusions. But we can look at some other key studies and think about a little bit further how we might add to this competency model based on the amazing work of, of uh, all the researchers who are contributing to understanding telehealth and the needs of the rural patients. So Farag did a study called Cross-Cultural Medicine, Sub-Sahara Africa. And telemedicine, according to Farag, is a social technical system reliant on social cultural factors rather than just a technical based system. And I thought this was so interesting, beginning to think beyond just the technology. There is a need for technology, but there's also a need for technology training. So this is aligned with what I found. And the author says the actor network theory that provides a foundation that there's a collection of physical and non-physical actors interacting with each other in both material and semiotic ways. So this idea that there would be this uh, uh, complex interaction going on via audio and video to try to understand and treat the patient is very interesting to me. 
And remember, we talked about, I said, you've got, it's important that the literature and the feedback that I'm seeing in the interviews and the surveys, you want to have both audio and visual, visual aids so that you can pick up on all of the communication that is necessary to truly treat and support patients. And so in this article, the researchers found that patients, in addition to receiving quality care, um, they need to have their feelings valued. And I think that's very powerful. I've created a competency model, you know, uh, that, that medical professionals must have understanding of technology, understanding of the rural resident, understanding of the remote patient, right? What does that mean? And Farag's kind of filling in those bubbles for us and saying part of what that means, understanding a remote patient, understanding a rural patient is understanding their feelings and then they must feel valued. And that's critical in terms of walking away from a telehealth experience and feeling good about the care that you received. And they want to be treated um, fairly. The patient wants to be treated fairly, and that is based on their perception of what is fairly. And the patient's perception of illness, symptoms, and traditional medicine matters. So filling in, what does that mean to support a rural and a remote uh, patient that is understanding their feelings, that is making sure they are treated fairly, that is understanding their perceptions of illness, symptom, and tradition. And in order to do that, we know that this high-level communication would have to be occurring over technology. So some subpoints in terms of looking at what is the patient's perception of healthcare. As I mentioned, I've worked in rural areas for a long time and some interesting things that I've seen, rural residents, um, they have their own view of self-care. And I have seen people who've set their own bones and there's much, more, there's much less talk about mental health. So just as a subpoint in terms of understanding and treating a patient that is at a distance from the provider far away, and that is in a rural area, you will have to, the provider will need to gain an understanding of what does healthcare look like to this individual. And it could be that this is somebody who is not comfortable talking about mental health. This is somebody who has set their own bones before. And that information is needed in order to create an environment where the patient's perceptions are respected. We can also look at another study, the individual and contextual determinants of the use of telemedicine. And this was a descriptive study where there was a quantitative questionnaire administered to 165 physicians working in public hospitals and 151 physicians working in district health centers, right? And the, the idea from this study is that telemedicine's use depends on individual and contextual factors. So um, this was a, an augmented qualitative district, dis, um, descriptive data involving these individuals with interviews, and they combined their qualitative and quantitative data. And they found an overview of what type of participants healthcare providers were offering telehealth. And they were primarily men. They had an average working age of 39 to 41. The majority of the physicians, 72%, worked in public hospitals and were likely to use telemedicine in their professional activities. And this did not differ by age, specialization, or region. So the use of telemedicine did not differ by age, special, specialization, or region, but it did differ based on location of the telemedicine uses. So location, where the telemedicine is being used, where the providers and the patients are located, it mattered in terms of influence of telemedicine usage. So a couple factors in there, technical factors that influence the telemedicine usage. It could be the provider was perfectly willing to offer telemedicine support, but there was a lack of computer, lack of medical equipment, lack of um, explorative help. So the availability of technology is considered critical. And in my interviews that I conducted, almost everyone said this is the greatest factor. Is the technology available? So many rural areas are absolutely lacking in infrastructure. 
And that is a critical point if we are going to look at telehealth as a solution to supporting rural residents. What are we going to do beyond training our provider and our patients and beyond understanding competency models and thinking about how we might effectively communicate and understand people's perceptions? Is the infrastructure there? And that's got to be a foundation question to consider. Also important is technology literacy. And this is the last study we'll, kind of, we'll look at perceptions of local healthcare quality in several seven rural California communities. And so rural health services can be difficult to maintain. This is what the researcher identified, that there's low patient volumes, limited numbers of providers, and there can be unfavorable economies of scale. And rural patients may perceive poor quality in local health care, directly impacting sustainability. And remember, we talked about the researcher that said perceptions of the patient and their experience in the, in the telehealth uh, process is critical to adoption, right? And what they're looking for is to be valued to be respected, to be understood. And so poor um, perceptions matter. What, how does the patient feel? And in this study, they examine the perceptions of local healthcare quality through 500 pre-telemedicine and post-telemedicine random surveys. And from these surveys, they determined residents are aware of telemedicine services in their community. And if they were aware of the res of these services, they had a significantly higher opinion of local healthcare quality. Satisfaction with telemedicine was rated high by both rural providers and patients. This is important. The introduction of telemedicine into rural communities is associated with increases in the local community's perceptions of local care, and telemedicine may result in a decreased interest and need for patients to travel outside the communities for healthcare services. So telehealth can minimize travel, telehealth can improve the quality of life for rural residents, and it can improve the just the availability of telehealth in a rural system can improve the patient's perceptions of the healthcare in their area. So rural patients' perceptions and experiences with telehealth influence their willingness to use the service. Rural patients' perceptions and experiences with telehealth can influence their trust in comprehensive healthcare services. So combined conclusions, when we look at my study and the work that I've done, and it's a work in progress, I've already launched into my the 2.0 of my research, but also looking at the body of literature that is out there. There's so much great literature and so many outstanding researchers who are looking at and examining what do we need to do to use telehealth to support our rural residents. And some concluding or combined conclusion points, perceptions of illness and respecting the patient is critical in telehealth. There are barriers to the adoption and use of technology. We know that some we're going to have to work on those barriers. They're going to have to be knocked down in addition to building up the competencies for both patient and provider. Patients' feelings about being valued and being treated fairly influence their perceptions of telehealth. Availability of technology is considered essential. It's one of the biggest stumbling blocks we have. Mainstream health education models should look at what and how people do in their lives when understanding their patients. You need to understand your patient comprehensively, and that can be a little bit more challenging and may require some strategy when we're working at that with them via distance. No health education solution is global in nature. Favor an open and free discussion with people as health professionals. We should not reject people's uh, knowledge and how they their causation pa patterns and what they believe causes and creates illness. And we need to keep communication between patients and healthcare providers open. Providers and patients need training in telehealth and providers and patients need access to up-to-date technology. So it's important that we have rural communities, each community, it needs medical leaders that not only have this competency model, this understanding of telehealth, we're going to have to also come to the table with awareness of culture. And this model is talking about understanding culture and how does the fit, how does the culture fit with telehealth? We need to bring specialists and dis, that are great distance to the patients. 
Can culture be taught? This is a question we all consider. Can culture translate through technology? Can patient needs be transferred through technology? How do we think um, these articles relate to the research I've developed? And what direction would we all want to take next? And I would like to add, when we look at the competency model that I presented, after gathering more information, I would put within the middle of that competency model that it is critical that healthcare providers and patients and um, healthcare leaders are all thinking about perceptions, feelings, they're building trust, there's training, there's open dialogue, and there's awareness of culture. Thank you very much. That was great, Jillian. Thank you so much for sharing. We appreciate that uh, presentation. That was a lot of great information in there. It always uh, is so helpful to remind myself how much of California is rural, um, as much as we like to focus on Los Angeles. So much of us do live in rural areas um, and have so many of these challenges uh, to face. So um, thank you for that helpful information. If there are any questions for Jillian, now is the time. So please go ahead and drop them in the chat or in Whova um, using that platform. Um, we do have a comment that says that we think, uh, I think that technology is there. The problem is the reimbursement models. Yeah. Such, I agreed. So important, key, critical point. I heard that from many of the um, interviews I was conducting. But some, some, um, some positives on that side is that the reimbursement models seem to be changing and seem to be um, more inclusive of telehealth. So that's good. I think that that, one's, that issue, you're, you're exactly correct, critical issue, and I hope to see it evolving in a positive way. I couldn't agree more. Um, it's definitely something we're watching, we're paying attention to. We have some sessions uh, later throughout the conference that we'll be focusing more on that policy and reimbursement side and um, you know how to work around those challenges. Um, but definitely uh, the technology is there. Um, and follow up to that comment, do you think that value-based payment models will help change this? I'm going to leave the the uh, the payment model. You know, this it's so complicated, isn't it? One of the things that I heard from my interviews um, with with the providers that are um, you know using this at this time, um, their concern about payment and how are we going to fix that challenge? And I think it was as as concerning as simply getting the technology and how are we going to set up a system that is going to acknowledge and respect and support telehealth. I mean, it's going to be an ongoing dynamic model of change where we're going to attempt a few things and we may find that some models work best best with some types of treatment and other models and other treatments or some models for some locations. And so I, I think that's it's such a huge and significant point. Um, it's hard to answer exactly what might be the right solution. Um, and we'll do one more question. Uh, are there any actions that we can take as providers to improve access to our telehealth services for our rural patients? Any advice? Um, you know, so those are, those are, I think that's an interesting question. Of course, we can get grants. Um, we can um, give out uh, technology. I, I was so inspired um, listening to the actions that people were taking um, that are committed to telehealth and to serving the rural communities. I've heard plans, everything from opening up maybe elementary school libraries in the evenings from six to 10 so that community members could come to the elementary school and use the computers um, to, and of course there's privacy concerns. And, and so there's all kinds of brainstorming and ideas like how would, how would this work, you know, in terms of, um, you know, uh, allowing people to come to uh, uh, schools 
to you know, receive their healthcare if they don't have infrastructure or computers in their homes. But some exciting technology is coming out out of Texas A&M. They have some pods now that can be just literally, they're kind of like phone booths. It can be just dropped down into rural areas and a patient can go into the pod and just push one button and have access to their healthcare provider, uh, receive prescriptions, receive you know, their vitals taken, things like that. Um, I talked to another individual who was describing that there are MRI machines in vans now that can pull up into patients' uh, driveways. Um, so there's amazing technology coming out. There's solutions and ideas about having the patients come to technology. Of course, we've all thought about um, can we get iPads and iPhones and things like that to patients in a way that they could reach their professionals. Um, and certainly there's a lot of grants out there to help help providers and uh, people in this research area bring the technology to the rural residents in need. So lots of ideas um, and lots of great brainstorming. And I think solutions are just around the corner. Yes, I agree. I think there's a lot of creative staff out there. Uh, the CTRC recently completed a video series with um, some rural health hospitals and clinics where we're looking at just uh, providing care for your different patient populations and tips for interacting with them on how to just conduct yourself well on video to make those connections happen. And um, the bigger stuff of getting that technology out there, improving that broadband access. So lots to consider. Um, thank you so much, Jillian, for sharing with us today. Um, I think she will be, she is on the Whova platform. So if you have any other questions, um, you can reach out to her that way. And I think she has shared um, contact information through her presentation. Um, so we'll have that recording available um, to you. Um, so now uh, with that, uh, we're going to transition to our next session, um, which will be leveraging innovative telehealth strategies and technology to increase revenue and quality. Um, for this session, um, I'll give us a second just to get our presentation pulled up. Uh, for this session, we do have two speakers on the agenda, um, Pete Ferrente and Ellie Lopez. I do want to make a note um, that unfortunately, Pete is not able to join us today due to a, an emergency, a personal concern. So um, we are lucky enough to just have Ellie speaking uh, to us today. Um, which is, she's a familiar face to the TRCs. Just give us a minute to get our presentation pulled up. Okay, I think we're ready to go. Um, all right, Ellie, I'm gonna hand the floor over to you. Excellent. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you guys so much for having me. It's always a pleasure to partner up with uh, CTRC. I love working with the folks over at CTRC and I'm always humbled to um, present. I'm very passionate about telehealth and healthcare and serving our underserved population. So I'm thrilled to be speaking to you today. Um, as Aislinn mentioned, the presentation topic today is going to be around leveraging innovative telehealth strategies and technology, um, really with a focus on increasing revenue and quality. Um, so before we um, really dive in deep, just if you can throw into the chat here um, your no-show rate, and if you guys are doing anything to um, supplement those no-shows that are happening, um, not just telehealth no-shows, but in-person no-shows. So if you're actually working at a facility um, or in the operational world, and you guys wanna share that, that would be great. Um, next slide, please. Great, so as Aislinn mentioned, um, my co-host today is unavailable. We're gonna send him our best. He's got a little bit of a medical emergency going on, um, but my co-host and I have sort of partnered. He was the, um, is the CEO of Exam Room Live and Joppy Connect. 
And Joppy Connect is a consulting agency that focuses on technology um, and really has a niche and an expertise in healthcare. Um, so we've partnered up and I've been able to have the pleasure of working with them on um, maximizing workflow efficiencies. They specialize for the last five years in uh, some healthcare software. And so I've had the pleasure to work with them and provide some sort of volunteer consulting, um, sort of my nighttime job, if you will, on uh, some ideas that can really help out our patient populations um, that we serve. And so the objectives for today's presentation really are about um, sort of how to evaluate, maximize, and leverage technology. <clears throat> so not necessarily introducing new technology always as a solution, but how to evaluate that. So maximizing the current systems that we're using in our healthcare um, systems. I know that not always can we just you know, buy a new EMR system or buy a new telehealth system, but how to look at our current systems and workflows um, and look at, can we maximize them? So we're going to use today an example of um, something that we call the standby model, how to evaluate our current no-show rates and see what opportunity for revenue um, we have and how to minimize our opportunity costs. We're also going to just look over how to evaluate your current vendors and systems, um, how you can look at your quality initiatives um, to maximize the opportunity for benefit while providing your patient care. And then if you are interested um, in looking at, you know, do we want to look at new vendors? How can you leverage those new vendors and technologies? How can you make sure that they're working for you to help you meet the patient needs? Um, because we have a lot of <laughs> demanding needs in healthcare. We're doing less with more every day. And so what really um, you all need and we need as healthcare providers is a vendor and technology to help support us and make us more efficient. Um, not necessarily for us to look at them as <clears throat> only a technology vendor for what they offer, but what can they build to sort of um, customize that helps us meet our needs. Next slide, please. So in the very beginning, I asked you guys if you could just share in the chat your no-show rate. Um, if you guys do know that no-show rate and don't necessarily want to share it, that's okay. But something that I think is really common right now in the healthcare um, systems is missed opportunities for revenue. And so we look at those as opportunity costs because although it is a no-show, if you don't do anything about that no-show, the opportunity for reclaiming uh, that as a visit, as a revenue stream is an opportunity cost. And so we found that on average, um, no-show rates are about 20% sometimes a little lower if you're talking about behavioral health or specialty, um, but about 20%. And so a lot of practices, um, especially in like family practice, they may double book, but a lot of practices have seen that that causes issues in their system. And so if you're double booking, a lot of providers are getting upset, patients are getting upset. So you're gonna have staff dissatisfaction, patient dissatisfaction, um, and you're gonna have issues daily should those patients all actually show up for their visits. And so something that we want to do is look at patient no-show rates because patients are no-showing since they have scheduling conflicts. Maybe they forgot about their appointment or they think that calling, you know, maybe it takes them an hour to get through to cancel or, or it's not easy for them to cancel an appointment. So we know that they happen and they see a few chats coming in. Um, it looks like some folks are roughly a little less than the 20%, about 16, 10 to 15 um, but having some great um, diligence in those confirmation calls. So let's go on to the next slide. We can talk a little bit more about what can we do <clears throat> to maximize our opportunity. So we um, have been discussing this for some time. If you guys have joined the CTRC presentations, you've heard me talk about this type of thing before and sort of how can we manipulate our current systems or how can we find a system that helps us to manipulate this situation that we have, especially now 
with telehealth and the demand for telehealth, we really have this excellent opportunity um, to maximize on this. So we started calling this a standby model, right? So when you go to the um, airport, there's a standby list. The airlines have this standby model that they, they have where, you know, the passenger might not necessarily have a foreshore ticket, but kind of waits in line in case there is an open seat and then um, they're you know, considered standby queue. So in order for this to work, um, truly what you need is a queue of patients who want to be seen, right? So those are kind of your walk-in appointments, your walk-in patients, maybe um, not necessarily urgent necessarily, but patients who call, hey, my child is sick, can I be seen today? And maybe their pediatrician doesn't have any openings, but their potential for no-shows um, should arise. And so that could be something that you could apply a standby model to. So standby users in the healthcare system um, really just need to be waiting to be seen in telehealth. And so you could fill an opening, whether that opening occurred from an in-person appointment or if the opening occurred from a telehealth appointment, you could potentially fill that with a patient in a queue um, from telehealth so that they would be sort of ready to join and they could join your provider as soon as you've identified that slot. Now, this process could be manual or automated depending on the systems that you guys are using, depending on um, how your EHR functions. A lot of us, we have EHRs that have something called a wait list in them. Um, from what I've seen and we've tried to attempt using a waitlist, it doesn't always work the best, a separate queue specifically for the day of, um, the provider of, or the specialty of seems to work the best, but you could automate this process um, should your system allow for it, or should you be working with a vendor um, that can customize something like that for you. Um, but there's also a manual way of doing it, very simply put, a live Excel sheet and, you know, your scheduling team and somebody focused on, on this. So if we can move to the next slide, please. So what I wanted to sort of show here is in healthcare, I think it's really funny um, that in healthcare in the last couple of years with COVID, a lot of people say, oh my gosh, you guys must be so busy. You guys must be making so much money. And they get the first part right. We're definitely really busy. Um, but they get the second part really, really wrong. Um, a lot of our the healthcare um, organizations have experienced an extreme hardship. We're losing staff. We're losing money. Um, a lot of those elective uh, healthcare um, surgeries or appointments or things of that sort, physicals, went undone. And so we lost a lot of opportunity for revenue due to the pandemic. And so we're still dealing with those shortages. So something that's really nice to look at is what can we do with our existing systems, with our existing providers? We don't need to hire anybody else. We don't need to add another exam room. How can we bring in some additional revenue? And so we've just done here a mock-up. Um, for example, Let's say that in your practice, if you're a fairly large practice, maybe you have in a month 3,000 no-shows. And so if your average reimbursement, I know it's a lot higher for several people, but if your average reimbursement per visit, let's say, is around $100 a visit, that opportunity cost per year is a little over $3 million. And so if you were to take a super conservative approach at trying to fill those no-shows with a standby. So let's say you only fill 10% per year of those no-shows with an actual visit that was successful. You can reclaim, you know, over $300,000. That is the salary of um, an MD, a provider, it's the salary of several support staff. And so I know that your operations team and your financial teams are looking at every dollar right now with all the shortages we have and the staff shortages. And so this is something that you guys can take back to your folks and say, hey, at a really conservative rate, if we did this and we were only 10% successful, here's how much money we could bring back in to the organization that we would have lost otherwise. And so something just to um, add to this, it's not just about money. Money does keep us going as healthcare providers, but it also opens up patient access. So I know as a mother, 
I have um, three children, one almost due um, in about a week and a half, actually. And so I try to call our pediatrician quite often. Sometimes we can't get in. I'm so grateful for when we are able to get in and have a telehealth visit because I don't have to drive all of the kids with me, put them all in the car, get them over to the doctor. Sometimes it can just be like, hey, the baby's got a rash. He looks at the rash. He checks you know, does she have fever, things of that sort, we're able to move on. So from a patient perspective, having something like this can also draw patients to your practice because this is how people want to receive their care. They want to be empowered. They want to know that if I need to call the same day, there is a possibility that I'll be seen without being sent in person and sitting there and waiting in hopes that if I wait in the waiting room for two or three hours, that I might be able to get in. This way they can wait from the comfort of their home. They can still pick up their kids from school. They can still you know, move along with their day. And then should they be picked up from the queue that day, they can have that um, provider access that they needed, you know, should they have identified it the night before or the morning of. So it really is an opportunity for us to improve our patient care, provide access to care for a patient sooner um, and in a more accessible way for patients that doesn't put them um, at risk and doesn't put sort of that burden on them to try to come in and wait in the waiting room. Um, and it doesn't add any additional overhead. Um, so your operational team will love you for <laughs> trying to move that forward. Next slide, please. So how would we mimic a standby model in your practice? So really the first step is some of you have already answered this in the chat is kind of just understanding what is your current revenue opportunity and how could you reclaim your no-show visits? So in some practices, this might not be the best way to go about it because um, you know not all of the practices and disciplines are able to have last minute telehealth visits. But if you're a pediatrician or family practice, or if you have an urgent care um, that's open for a few hours a day, this is something that can absolutely work and your patients will love the idea that they have more access in a different way. And so understand your opportunity, look at your no-show rates across the board. If you have several locations or just look at one location, if you wanna sort of start small, find a location where maybe you have that family practice, general practice, um, and apply that formula to your practice. And, and I'll provide you guys with a formula um, in a slide here, but really just understanding what is our no-show rate and how, how gutsy do we wanna be? Do we think we can reclaim 10%? Is our patient population a little bit more tech savvy? And we think like 20% would actually participate in this. Um, and then you really need to build a queue. And so there's so many ways about this. You could work with the vendor, um, a new vendor or an existing vendor to help you build a queue. Maybe your system already has one and you just don't know about it. You could manipulate your, your current waitlist queue that's in your EMR. Um, it gets a little bit trickier, but it's totally possible. Or you could just use a live Excel document and have a staff member clear that out every day and somebody who's in charge of you know, that live document putting patient names on that list and making that your queue. So it really doesn't have to be so complex, but you do need to make a queue of some sort in order for this to work. And so then what you need to do is identify those open slots. So maybe your practice has a rule where you're not considered a no-show until you're 15 minutes past your appointment. Um, at this point, right, a lot of the provider visits, especially in general practice and pediatrics, those appointment slots may only be 15 minutes. So if your provider was running behind, that works out, they catch up. But if your provider was on time, now those 15 minute appointment slots have sort of gone nowhere. And so you need to evaluate as a practice, at what point do we want to consider this no-show a spot that has opened up in the queue? And so that might be at five minutes, right? So at five minutes, um, the pediatrician, for example, has patient has not showed up yet. So maybe they're running late, but we haven't heard from them. We've called them. We haven't heard from them. So they may likely no show. So at the five minute mark, we open them up in the queue and let the pediatrician choose um, their next appointment from the queue. And then if the patient shows up, you know, we can work with the pediatrician if we need to squeeze them in. And so it's really important 
work with your team, work with your operational team, work with the pilot provider, find out what could work best to fill those no-shows. And at what minute mark would you guys feel comfortable considering that no-show an open slot for your queue? And then final step would be to fill that slot. So you can, again, do this manually. You can have your staff send a link to the patient, call the patient and say, hey, you know, Dr. Frida, we're able to get you in if you can join in the next three or four minutes or next five minutes, please go ahead and wait in the queue and the doctor will join the visit shortly. Um, this can also be automated. You can work with a software vendor and this can be automated where the patient automatically gets a text message, the system fills the appointment and your staff don't need to make those calls. Your, your system does the work for you. Um, so a lot of ways to go about this, but again, work with your systems, work with your vendors, and just explore how can you make this work in your practice. Next slide, please. So this is the formula, again, um, just something we put here for you guys to use. We've also created a toolkit, Aislinn will um, put a link in the chat uh, for the toolkit. I've also added the link on um, my bio in the platform that we're using for the conference. But really what you need to do in order to understand the opportunity costs for no-shows specifically, but you could apply something similar for other areas, is get your average number of no-shows. So usually in a month or in a year, um, your operations team or your finance team will know mm -hmm. the average number of no-shows. Maybe you wanna do a specific discipline, but go ahead and apply that average. Get your average reimbursement rate per visit, um, and then that's going to tell you what your opportunity cost is. <laughs> that's going to tell you if we don't do anything, here's what we're losing because we don't do anything every year. Um, and then you can put in, right, how risky do you want to be? Do you want to be pretty conservative? Do you want it to be 10% that we think we can reclaim? Do we think we can reclaim 50%? Um, and then find out and let your team know, hey, here's our goal. We're going to try to reclaim 15% of our no-shows with a standby queue. And here's how much money we're gonna to hope to reclaim in this next year. And find out if you're successful and, and pilot that and work with your, your provider team and your operations team. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so we kind of went through some of this, um, but just to go over a little bit more in detail. Building a queue, um, you really also need to consider a few questions, right? So we talked about it could be an Excel online form. It could be a Google Docs. Use something live. Don't use something static that's on someone's computer because if you need to have multiple staff look at that um, and they forgot to delete a name or anything like that, it's going to be problematic. So best practice would be to use something live um, like your EMR uh, system, like a software um, that your vendor has for you or a new vendor has for you um, or an Excel online. And then what you need to do is make a few decisions. So you need to decide how patients are prioritized, right? Is your practice gonna prioritize patients by maybe their chief complaint? Um, is, are they gonna prioritize them just by first come, first serve, whoever called first, they're first in line, sort of like that standby model at the airport or at restaurants, right? Like whoever came in first gets the table first, gets the seat first. Um, do you also wanna decide who is going to manage that queue. So you don't necessarily need new staff to do this, but you do wanna make sure whoever you assign to this, maybe it's your front office staff, um, maybe you have an office manager who helps to manage the day and the schedule. Um, so make sure you identify that person. Um, and it could even be you know, a telehealth coordinator. I know in the last couple of years, a lot of folks um, have had, sort of, and I don't wanna use the word luxury, but in healthcare right now, it's sort of a luxury if you have any additional staff anywhere. So if you have the luxury of having a telehealth coordinator, I would say they're probably the best person, best suited for this task. Um, but even a call center representative, scheduler, you could work with anybody who understands getting patients scheduled and getting them seen. Next, please. Thank you. So identifying and filling those time slots, again, um, you want to just create a workflow that identifies your opening. So what do you consider an opening? Is it um, only specific types of appointments? Maybe if you have appointments that were 
30 minute appointments. Those are the ones that you want to consider standby um, queue available. Or if it's all of your appointments, it doesn't matter. Or maybe it's not your OB, but your pediatrician. Um, so you wanna work with your team to identify what type of appointments can be considered available should a patient no show to them. And at what time um, should those be notified? Um, is it cancellations under 24 hours? Is it if a patient reschedules in less than 24 hours? Um, or is it only the ones that just truly don't show up on the day of? And then you want to try to create some automation whenever you can. Um, so I highly encourage you guys to work with your vendors, um, work with your systems to automate wherever you can, because we know in healthcare right now, we are so short staffed and so overburdened. And so adding anything new can feel really, really difficult with our teams, but automating the process whenever. So can you build a pop-up in your system? Um, can your vendor build a pop-up in the schedule that says, okay, you know, Miss Ellie didn't show up. It's five minutes <coughs> past Ellie's appointment. Would you like me to add to the queue? Yes. Great. So it adds to the queue. And then it says, um, you know, Aislin is on the queue. Would you like me to send her a text message to see if she's available for the appointment? Yes. And then it prompts and sends a text message with the link for her to join. Um, so there's a lot of automating that can happen in the systems. We just need to work with your IT teams, work with your vendors, find out wherever you can skip a click. <laughs> your staff will be very grateful for that. And then again, filling those time slots. It might be manual process, but if you can automate it in any way, you have any um, patient call automation, patient text message automation, use that to your advantage, work with your vendors. And then I would highly recommend wiping that queue on a daily basis, because what happens is if you don't wipe that on a daily basis, or if you don't have a separate queue and consider it rolling into the next day, should your patients want that option, um, it really ends up looking like the wait list in all of our EMRs, which is very complicated and doesn't get wiped out and doesn't get cleaned in some of our larger practices and then doesn't serve its purpose. Um, so I would make sure to have some type of process where <coughs> the patients who don't get seen that day are asked, would you like to be on the queue the next day? And then if they do, we wipe the queue and we create the next day's queue with new list of patients. Next slide, please. Thank you. So um, something that's really important in all of this is to evaluate um, your, your system, evaluate your workflow, evaluate your efficiencies. And so I have this little picture of an apple here with the sticker um, that doesn't seem very fitting <laughs> into our workflows. But I heard a story about this before, and it's really about not passing the buck on to your patients. So when you identify your systems, you really want to look at your workflows. You want to identify what is going to move you forward, what changes you want, and you want to identify those weak points. Um, you don't want to pass that on to your patients, right? So you don't want to make a harder click for your patient or your staff even because you can't figure the problem out. So in the, in the fruit world, um, you have all these, you know, stickers on all of your fruit. And the real reason for us having to peel that every time we want to go eat our apple is because they couldn't figure out in the industry how to do inventory on a whole bunch of apples. And so they put a sticker on every single apple. And really what they did was pass that on to us. They passed that problem on to us as the consumers. And so I really think that in healthcare, it's a very fine line where we get our patients to say, telehealth was easy. My appointment was easy. I can take this. And if we put any more pressure on them or pass any, you know, bucks on to our patients, we are going to create hesitancy in their usage of telehealth and their comfort um, and their experience. So again, really make sure that you don't put any workflow issues onto your patient. Try to take as much of that off in either manual or automated process as possible. And then um, finally is just continuous training. At the beginning of the pandemic, it was all hands on deck. We did training, we trained everybody, we had workflows. Have we revisited them? Have we retrained providers? Have we refreshed our staff? And so making sure that all of your staff, the new folks and all of those who've been you, with you for a long time 
know the same thing. Do refresher trainings, just like we do our HIPAA training every year. Maybe have you know your, your tech training, your telehealth training um, every year or every quarter so that people stay on top of it. Next slide, please. So I think we're, we're getting a time warning, um, so I'll try to talk through this very quickly. Um, but really something that you want to do as far as leveraging technology um, is invest time into your monitoring of your workflows, invest um, time into evaluating the efficiencies of your system, automate your workflows, um, work with your vendors, ha have them work for you. Don't be afraid to ask them questions and to ask for customizations. Um, just because that's their out of the box product doesn't mean that they may not be willing to do some things for you. Share information with your vendors. Tell them about your space limitations, your shortages. Explain to them what your world looks like and see what they can do to help you with that. And then advocate for your patient needs. Um, you know, a story I like to tell all the time is I was working with Microsoft Teams. I was participating in their TAP program um, when they were launching telehealth early on, and they kept using verbiage that was really business verbiage, right? Join your meeting. And so they kept saying, here's what your patient is going to join. It says, join your meeting. And we kept advocating. We kept saying, it is not a meeting. Please make it an appointment or something that is patient friendly. And so I encourage you guys to do the same because your priorities are your patient experience. Um, that's what helps to empower your patients. And we need to remember that ultimately our goals are to advocate for them, to make our workflows efficient and to empower our patients and meet them where they're at so we can help um, to better serve them. Next slide, please. All right, so just some next steps is really engage all levels of your staff. Um, when you pilot, don't forget your frontline staff. Don't forget your operations team. Don't forget your medical assistants. Their voices are really powerful. Um, they're the ones, you know, we learned in our practice specifically at RFQHC that we thought our providers were the ones that were difficult to get on to telehealth visits. And what we found out was it took two extra clicks um, for a telehealth visit. And so it was actually our frontline staff. It was actually our schedulers who we needed to work with. So really set your goals, set your expectations and include everybody into that pilot. Um, find out how to best maximize your scheduling templates, prioritize that training, and then advocate for investment into your telehealth solution. A lot of us launched two years ago and we haven't been able to um, revisit that. So just know it's okay if it's not perfect right out the door, um, but piloting will help you to create some workflow efficiencies. Next slide, please. All right, so here's our contact information. Um, we have created a toolkit with some workflows for you all. Um, that Aislin put a link into the chat. And I will be doing peer-to-peer um, -peer chat this afternoon. So we may run out of time here for questions, but if you guys have any other questions, feel free to contact me directly or to join a peer-to-peer -peer chat later on. Thank you guys so much. Thank you, Ellie. That was great. Um, yes, we are we are a little bit over, so we're gonna um, transition through the Q&A. There are some in Whova that uh, we might be able to respond to. Uh, typing and uh, just going to strongly suggest, as Ellie mentioned, we do have her available this afternoon for the peer to peer chats. So if you're interested in continuing a conversation with Ellie, getting some more questions answered, please sign up to meet with her. Um, she'll be happy to connect with you and continue the conversation. Um, thank you all so much for attending. Uh, we are breaking for lunch right now and coming back at 1 p.m. for our next session. Thank you so much for joining.